Welcome to the Breaking Into Finance podcast. My name is Craig Thompson, and this is the open source field guide to help you understand everything you need to know about breaking into finance. Let's dive in. How do you think the margins are in, say, like a gas station? So let's say it's like an independently owned gas station where you get your gas from somewhere else. There are all these other gas stations like dotted around you that are competing for for business. Do you think that's a high margin or a low margin business? Um, the like independently owned one is that yeah the... yeah. So this is I I run my own gas station. I buy my gas from, you know, Exxon or, you know, some uh, oil distributor. And then I, you know, I sell that gas to, you know, to individuals who are driving their cars. I want to say low margin. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's, it's competitive. Someone else could just open up, you know, another gas station right next to me. Um, and you're sort of beholden to these like market rates that are like changing every day. And Let's say I tried to make it a high margin business. Like, let's say I tried to charge 20%, um, you know, like a markup above my costs of like 20%. Um, someone else would just open a gas station yeah. right next to me and like, they, or the ones that already exist right next to me, then they'd, they'd undercut it. Um, and then the other thing is like, how scalable is my individual gas station? Like, what if I had cars lining up, um, you know, for blocks and blocks? Um, First off, like the amount of gas I can store in my physical location is is limited. Mm -hmm. There are a limited number of slots to serve other customers because if people were lined up out the door, then like they'd probably go to another gas station or someone else would would build one. I could build one, but there's like a lot of costs with each one I build, right? Like I have to outlay money every time. And so that's an example of one, it's a mature market, right? Like gasoline sales for cars isn't like growing 10% a year. Um, It's been around for a while. So I likely have like a competitor gas station across the street already. Um, So it's hard for me to scale. The margins are low because it's extremely competitive. And so these are all the things that would lead to, you know, per dollar of profit, a, you know, a gas station being valued so, so, so much lower than like, you know, a software business. Okay. That makes sense. And then I also had a question about the line items in an in- of the income statement. And if we could just kind of go over the most important ones again, if possible. Yeah. And I, Fortunately or unfortunately, I feel like every line item in the income statement is important and tells a story, but the high notes are really revenue matters a lot because that is kind of the lifeblood of your business. Like depending not only on the magnitude of revenue, like how many dollars of revenue you have, but also your revenue growth over time. That is telling you kind of like how big is your core business and are you growing or shrinking over time and by how much? Gross profit and gross margin also matter a lot. I would say gross margin, like if you know revenue, the next thing I really care about is gross margin because I can calculate gross profit based on that. Like gross profit is my revenue times my margin. And the margin, just seeing that percentage of like 70% margin or 20% margin or or whatever gives me a really good heuristic in my head for thinking about if this business were to grow, by how much does profit grow? Um, like if I'm going to double my revenue, am I going to, you know, is my profit going to go up by, is it going to double? Is it going to? like go up by like 50%, just like seeing the kind of like elasticity of profit relative to revenue. The next line item below gross margin that matters a lot is operating margin. Operating margins calculated in in kind of exactly the same way, but instead of referencing gross profit, it references operating profit, which is also our EBIT. Um, 
So operating profit, operating margin, EBITDA and EBITDA margin. Um, all of these are, are helpful metrics for basically saying when I layer in all of my fixed costs to like how, how high of a margin uh, is this business. And profit matters, like your earnings matter, especially if you're looking at public companies. The number one valuation ratio that people look at with public companies is price divided by earnings. So if a stock is trading at 100 bucks a share, I really want to know what my earnings per share is. Um, so I can calculate my P my PE ratio, which is the number one, you know, kind of valuation metric that people look at. Let's take that gasoline business relative to that hypothetical software business. Which one do you do you think they would trade? They should trade at the same PE ratio, or do you think one should have a higher PE ratio than the other? I was actually quickly going to ask if we could go over PE ratio again. And I know we talked about it like in depth um, in a previous episode, but I was also wondering why that was one of the more important like valuation metrics um, in regards to the other ones, because I yeah. think I, okay. A, a lot of what it comes down to is as we've talked about free cash flow. if you could know the future and you could pick one metric that matters, I'd pick free cash flow. If I could just know what the free cash flow of the business was going to be over the next hundred years, it is very simple for me to do some corporate finance math and value those future cash flows. But we don't know the future. And it turns out that net income and like EBIT and EBITDA, like those three like income statement line items are often the best predictors of future free cash flow. Like if you know like the net income this year, that number is a better predictor of next year's free cash flow is than if you knew this year's free cash flow. The biggest reason for that is free cash flow can get impacted by, I'll call it like management decisions rather than the core performance of the business. So for example, it could be the case that this year as a company, I borrowed $2 billion in debt. And that would show up on my cash flow statement. Like my cash flow this year would be $2 billion higher just because I decided to borrow money. Um, or similarly, I could have decided to invest in, you know, building a new plant this year. Um, and in that case, my free cash flow would be lower by, you know, the cost of that plant. And so the idea is like, there's this stuff going on that isn't like the core operations of the business that don't help me predict next year's free cash flow. And so, you know, we have the benefit of knowing all of these numbers so we can kind of contextualize this. So we could look at this year's free cash flow, break down on the cash flow statement, how much was coming from operations, how much was coming from investing, how much is coming from financing, and we can kind of piece the puzzle together. But at the end of the day, like your net profit and your profitability, like those are dollars that will become available for owners of the company to take as dividends. And the two ways that you actually get money out of a company, like you're doing all this work, like the company is like producing all this profit and all this cash flow. At the end of the day, the way that you as a shareholder make money is either the company pays a dividend, which basically means that they are taking some of their cash and saying, you know, we are paying a dividend of a billion dollars to, you know, to stockholders. And you know, we look at how many shares of stock exist and everybody gets, you know, their percentage. The other way that, you know, a, a long-term shareholder gets their money is if the company gets bought. And if the company gets bought for whatever, $50 a share, then, and you had owned this company for the last 30 years, then for the last, you know, 29 years, you're getting whatever the dividend has been every year, if they pay a dividend every year, and then you're getting your $50 per share at the end. Um, now we live in a world where there's this public stock market, there's this liquid market where people can buy and sell stocks. So those are kind of fundamentally the two ways that stockholders make money. But 
There is also kind of this other, you know, knock on market where I could just sell my shares to somebody else. Like I don't need the company to get bought to get my $50 a share. I could just, if someone else is willing to pay me $50 for it, then, you know, have at it. Mm -hmm. Um, But those are the things that kind of underpin value. Okay. And so given that this kind of like net income, this like earnings figure is the core of this, what people compare when you're figuring out like, hey, should I buy some Apple stock right now? Um, Is you would look at how much does a share of stock cost? Like it's, is it trading for like 175 bucks a share? And then the question you might ask is, well, what am I getting for my 175 bucks a share? And so the most common way you would think about looking at that is you'd look at not just the total earnings of the company, but you'd divide, you know, last year's net income by how many shares exist because your one share gets you like your little small percentage of all that earnings. So you'd look at the price per share of a stock and you'd look at the earnings per share of the stock. And so that's kind of like the heuristic that in public markets people think about is like, if a company trades at a PE ratio of 25, that means that its stock price is 25 times greater than the earnings per share that that company generates. So PE ratio is the most common ratio that people look at in public markets in private markets, which basically means like in like private equity literally means owning stock in companies that you couldn't just go to your broker and buy stock in. Um, It's companies that are not publicly traded. And there people actually use a different ratio called EV to EBITDA, enterprise value, which is different from equity value relative to EBITDA. EBITDA is also a frequently looked at um, kind of like profitability baseline for understanding valuation of a company. That makes sense. So then back to your original question of which would have a greater PE ratio, the gas station, the privately owned gas station or the software company, I believe. Yeah. And and for this, for these purposes, it's like you own the gas station. And I only say that versus like Exxon, you know, like extracts oil and then they, um, you know, and then they distribute the oil and then they sell it in their own store. Like, I was just trying to simplify it. Like you don't have to worry about extraction or anything. Like okay. Sell gas. Um, but it is a public company um, that, you know, we can buy stock in, which okay. is why we care about their P ratio to begin with. Mm-hmm. So then would it, I'm leaning towards saying that the software company would have a greater P ratio because as you said, the P ratio kind of just, is a way like is a way to value a company um yeah so tell tell me about that like why if you see that the software company has a pe ratio of 25 and this like gas station has a pe ratio of 10 what are some reasons why you might be like hey like i am more comfortable paying 25 times earnings for the software company than i'm comfortable paying much less per dollar of earnings i get today from the gas station because well for one the software company might be i guess a more reliable source of making sure that i guess you're getting your earnings back since with its pe ratio being a comparison of like the price of a stock to its earnings wouldn't in the software company even though technically the earnings would be less than say in like the gas station, the price of the stock would also be less because of the company. Um, I totally agree with the first part of your answer that the software okay. business should trade at a higher P ratio than this gas station in this example that we've set up. Um, that's totally the right intuition, but I want to refine a little bit on the logic behind it. PE, this ratio is a backward looking ratio, right? Like I'm looking at the stock price today relative to what earnings was last year. But really the way I'm going to make money owning this stock is based on future earnings, right? And future cash flow. Like I'm going to make money owning this stock based on what my profits are going to be next year, 
and the following year and the year after that. And so the reason why the software company in this example is trading at a higher P multiple than the gas station is one growth. If they are structurally growing every year, like if revenue is growing every year, then their price divided by last year's earnings might be 25, but their price divided by next year's earnings might be 20. Okay. And price divided by earnings in two years might be 15. Whereas if this gas station revenue is flat, profits are flat, you know, the P ratio might be 10 today, but it's going to be 10, you know, the, the price of the stock today is still 10 times next year's earnings. So one is growth, which is basically to say, if a company is faster growing and their revenue is growing at a faster rate, then their P ratio will be higher because that is going to lead to higher profits in the future. The other thing that matters is margins, right? Because if my revenue is growing like crazy, but I'm a low margin business, that crazy growth in my revenue is going to lead to only moderate growth in my in my EBIT. Okay. Um, and in my earnings. But if I'm a high margin business, then more of my revenue growth filters through to profitability. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and by the way, there is another ratio that it's it's not like the number one ratio. First off, these ratios, like I'm going to talk a about a lot that people kind of commonly use. You can make up your own breaking ratios if it's helpful to you, um, which is a thing that throughout history people have done. Like in the tech bubble, there were all of these public companies that like didn't have revenue yet. And so if you don't have revenue, so well, first off, there are today and there have for a long time been unprofitable companies that are public companies that still have a value greater than zero. And so the P ratio is meaningless for them, right? Like in 2012, Amazon was not a profitable company. Um, so their P ratio is like, you know, it's like technically negative or it's like infinity. It's totally not meaningful. Like, so... Amazon at the time did not trade on a PE ratio. But what they were doing, you know, is they had, you know, billions and like hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue. And so what people did is they traded Amazon or viewed Amazon, valued Amazon on a price to sales ratio, where they were trying to look at the price of Amazon stock relative to their revenue. Because Amazon was basically making an intentional decision to take every dollar of, you know, uh, of like gross profit that they were generating and reinvest that into their business. So for every dollar that they were making off people going to Amazon and like buying things, they were, you know, buying servers and working to set up, um, you know, their database and software business um, and AWS, like Amazon Web Services. Somebody at some point was like, hey, like there's this unprofitable company that it shouldn't be worth zero. Um, how do we value them? And someone's like, hey, how about price to sales? Um, there are companies that don't generate revenue that still have value. Um, this is like one example of in the venture capital space when VCs were trying to back Facebook very early in its growth. They had all these users and like everybody was like clicking on stuff. They had this great engagement, but they didn't show any ads yet. So they didn't have any revenue. So then the question is like, what should this thing be worth? And what people did was they looked at comparable companies that are like software businesses that do make money off of like ad clicks. And they'd basically say, hey, like, what is like the price per click? Like, can I find out the number of clicks and number of hits and, you know, website visits that this company gets? And, you know, this, this other company that is profitable. So I can be like, okay, there's this other company that trades at a P ratio of five, that trades at a price to click ratio of, you know, whatever, of like 
two. Well, maybe I should value Facebook at a price to click ratio of slightly less than two because they haven't proven that they can sell ads effectively. Like there's risk. This is stuff that's going to happen in the future. So I don't think it's quite worth a price to click ratio of two. What about 1.5? And then they can back into evaluation from there. Um, so all of these ratios are basically like trying to think about first in a world where you could use P ratio, then great. But then you have to adjust the P ratio for the growth expectations of these businesses, for the margins of these businesses. And then there are these other companies that are not profitable. And you might want to find some other way of trying to think about what they should be worth. Okay. That was kind of that a long-winded sense. answer. Did that did you did No, you that, that makes sense? Um, it's definitely helpful to think of like the examples that you used with Amazon and like um the firm. Like it's helpful to think about how these different, I guess, ratios can help determine like like how they tell us different things about a company. Yeah. And and at the end of the day, that's why knowing what all of these line items are and what they aren't is so important because if you're an investor and you're trying to figure out where should I put my money like there are you know tens of thousands of stocks that I could buy how do I know which one is the best bang for my buck there is in the real world almost nobody is building a DCF to like value a company in a vacuum a lot of times they're looking at relative value between companies and saying well hey you know, this is where, you know, like Alphabet, which owns Google, has been trading for the longest time. This is where Microsoft has been trading for the longest time. When LinkedIn was its own company or like when Slack, you know, they were both formerly public companies that have been acquired. Um, when they were public companies, wh what were they valued at? And not only like what was their P ratio, but what was their price to, to sales? Like, what was their price per monthly active user? Like you're kind of trying to reason through how does what I'm looking at compare to something else that I can more kind of clearly associate with P ratio um, or some kind of foundational valuation. Um, and then I'll work backwards to try to figure out a range of values that this company could be worth. And I could say, but this is smaller than that company. It's lower growing than that other company or it's higher margin than that other company. And I'll use kind of what I know about all of these other metrics and what I know about the business, you know, what the outlook for the business is that I can say, this company, company A is worth whatever, company B that I'm investigating should be worth more or less on any of these three valuation ratios that I look at. That does it for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. And remember to check out our website, breakingintofinancepodcast.com, where you can submit questions, join our Substack to stay up to date on new content releases, and much, much more. We'll see you next time.